Our second scripture today is from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 33, verses 14 to 16. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called, The Lord is Our Righteousness. Back when I was a child, every year at this time in Sunday school, our Sunday school teacher gave every child a present. And back in those days, Sunday schools were big, as some of us remember. And those little presents sometimes had meaning, sometimes they didn't, but often they were something religious in nature. And one that I got one year was a wooden plaque. And painted on it was a little branch with two blue birds that looked as if they may have come from a Disney movie. You know, those little blue birds singing beside Snow White or Cinderella as they danced through the forest. And, and, and it was one of those kinds of pictures, but it had a quote on it from a famous Baptist missionary, Adoniram Judson. And the quote was, the future is as bright as the promises of God. The future is as bright as the promises of God. That little wooden plaque hung on my bedroom wall from my childhood up until we moved from that house when I was a senior in high school. And somehow it got lost, I think, in the move. Growing up, in the 50s and early 60s, that quote, made, that quote made sense to a middle-class white boy in a blue-collar paradise called Pittsburgh. <laughs> Wages were excellent in Pittsburgh at that time. Good jobs were easily found, not only for, for full-time work, but even over the summer. I had lots of friends and acquaintances as college students who every summer worked in the steel mills and made really, really good money doing that. We had strong unions at that time in Pittsburgh, and that spilled out across the whole, the whole economy because if steel workers made that amount of money and there were jobs in the steel mills, then everybody else had to pay equally well if you wanted good workers. It was a blue-collar paradise, plus cost of living was, was low. We lived in a time when technology provided one marvel after another. And even though we started out behind in the space race, it wasn't long until it felt like we were winning. Everything seemed to be getting better and better, and there was no reason to think that anything would ever change, that it would not continue that way forever. And then, of course, things did change. The cities exploded. Racial issues presented themselves and became obvious to those of us who, because of the color of our skin, had been able to ignore them for far too long. The joke where I lived in the city of Pittsburgh was that every May we got five days off from school, like clockwork, because that was when the cities got too tense and the kids got sent home. The body count from Vietnam was on the news every evening, and we saw those names as they scrolled by, and we felt that. In a relatively short time, four major national leaders were assassinated. But in the midst of all of that, we still had a sense of optimism. We still had a sense of optimism. We could 
change the world. Young people marched in the streets against Vietnam because they believed we can stop the war. They believed that. African Americans and their allies marched because they believed that they could change a society for whom one of its foundational principles had been racism. But they believed we can eradicate this, this societal sin and change the world. Women burned their bras because they believed we can be seen as equals to men in every single facet of life. And through all of that, technology continued to rocket forward, sometimes literally. <clears throat> Those words hung on my wall for all of that time because I believed them. I believed them. We all did, or at least everyone I knew. Folk who had life hard, folk who had life better, we all believed that the future was bright and would only become brighter. We dreamt of a world where technology could solve every problem, where every illness would be defeated. I remember lining up to get my polio vaccination. Some of you remember that. I had a girlfriend who had polio, so I knew what that could look like. I knew it. And those of you who were a little bit older than me knew even better than I did what that could look like. And yet, there we were, all lined up at Turner Elementary School, waiting to get our vaccination. We saw a world where, for the first time, there were educational opportunities for everyone. I went to a little liberal arts college in central Pennsylvania. I don't think they'd ever had a black person within 50 miles of that place. Now, well, maybe a couple. Until the year I went, my freshman year, and all of a sudden, there was a whole crew of new African-American students. Because the school saw a moral obligation to try to increase its diversity, and our country said, you know what, we're going to make colleges do that, even if they don't want to. This school did want to. We continued to see the standard of living going steadily up. Life expectancy went up every single year. And in spite of real problems in our world, we felt as if we were making progress on every single front. On every single front. And it was easy to believe Adoniram Judson's words. The future is as bright as the promises of God. I had heard those promises in Sunday school, and I believed the future was at least that bright. In Jeremiah's time, it wouldn't have been so easy to believe those words. But indeed, even more necessary. Jeremiah lived in a time of incredible turmoil and incredible change. He, in his lifetime, saw the Assyrian Empire fall only to be replaced by Babylon. He saw a time when Judah had seen its, its, boundaries, its boundaries expanding and growing as a nation. And it seemed a time when the people of God would actually fulfill God's purpose for them. He saw that. And then he saw the king Josiah killed in battle, only to be replaced by his first son, who only lasted as king for three months, to be replaced by his second son, Jehoiakim, who didn't do so well, and became known for oppressing his own people, who became known for alienating all of the major powers of the day and leading his nation in such a way that resulted in then being invaded by Babylon, Judah destroyed, and the people sent into exile. And Jeremiah's message changed with the situation as he watched all of this. Early on, he had been a supporter of Josiah and Josiah's reforms. 
You might remember that the temple had been destroyed and Josiah was rebuilding it. And in the rebuilding, the story tells us they found the book of Deuteronomy. And Josiah had that read for all of the people and said, this is who we are as the people of God and we're going to own that. And he made that religious and political reform that they committed to being the people of God together. Jeremiah saw that and, and supported that. But as time went on, and especially after Jehoiakim became the king, he became disillusioned. Corruption in government and, and in the temple itself was growing. And Jeremiah said, wait a second, this is not who we are supposed to be. And he began to call out both government and religion. And eventually he preached that the people should stop trusting in their government. And they should stop trusting in all of those institutions that they had been told would keep them safe, especially the army of Judah and its alliances with Egypt and the Egyptian army. And Jeremiah said, if you continue to trust here, you will see Jerusalem fall. And indeed it did. Under the rule of Babylon, then he continued to call for the people to submit to Babylon's rule and watch and see what God would do, only to be labeled a traitor for doing that. And by the time of today's passage, everything is completely disintegrated. The people are in exile. They have lost everything. There is no hope left for the future. There is no reason to believe in anything. The future, as they looked around, was anything but bright. The only promise they could hear was one of more pain, more despair, more loss, with the end becoming the people of Judah being nothing more than a little footnote in history that says something like, oh yeah, there was this little nation called Judah. They believed that they were God's chosen people. They've now disappeared. That was all they could see coming. And in that situation, Jeremiah switches from a message of doom to one of hope. And he starts to talk about this new covenant with God. He sees promises fulfilled. He sees justice, righteousness, safety, hope, peace. These are the concepts that are the keys to his message. They were words his people needed to hear. They needed to hear grace and hope when there seemed to be none. Tradition tells us that Jeremiah was stoned to death in Egypt while in exile. Didn't make it back to, to Jerusalem to see his, his words at least partially fulfilled. He never saw, tradition tells us, Cyrus march into Babylon, Cyrus of Persia march into Babylon without a battle and take over the empire. He didn't get to hear that word from Cyrus that said to all of the exiles in the, in the Babylonian Empire, you can all go home. He didn't get to see those words of hope filled full. But indeed they were. Indeed they were. But Jeremiah knew that words spoken by God are as good as fulfilled as soon as they are spoken. Even if you don't see the result just yet because God has promised, that is enough. He would have heard those words from Judson and said, well, duh, of course the future is as bright as the promises of God. Because the promises of God are the bedrock upon we can build our lives and trust and know there isn't even any question there. He would have known that. Now today our time is as different as it could be from the time of Jeremiah. It's even just as different as the time when I was growing up as a child. We live in a time of crisis. We live in a time when a lot of people don't have very much hope. And those who do have hope 
hang on to it by the skin of their teeth. I was talking with Jessica before, before service this morning, and I don't know how many of you watched Saturday Night Live, but they had a skit last night where they were singing a song, All I Want for Christmas is for Mueller's, Mueller's Report to be released. And then one of them said, unless there's nothing in it, then please don't release it. Because we need to have hope. We need to have hope. We need to have hope. And yet, this time of crisis in which we live is a time when hope seems hard to come by. When so much has fallen apart. Those idealists of the 1960s that looked around and said, we can make a new and better world long ago, at least many of them long ago, gave up those hopes and instead embraced what are probably the worst parts of the American dream. I can't change the world, so I'm just going to make a million bucks for myself and buy a house in Montecito. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. People who are watching this on YouTube are going, yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't know that a million bucks in Montecito won't buy you a doghouse. <laughs> <laughs> We've watched as the institutions upon which we rely have lost their power. Religion has lost a central place. Government leaders are, as often as not, seen it as in it only for themselves or for those who have filled their pockets. I read a thing this week that said millennials don't vote because they don't think it makes any difference. They believe, as a group, that all of the politicians out there are only in it for themselves. And one of the words that gets thrown around about the present administration is kleptocracy. We've watched as education becomes less available for our young folk. And those who do do it come out of college with student debt that is just astoundingly high. And so end up with a millstone around their necks sometimes well into their 50s. The system of justice, many feel, is not trustworthy. The news is seen as biased. Truth itself is under attack, and we have a general sense of selfishness. The values that we have claimed to, to hold as a nation are dismissed. We struggle with changes in a world that's becoming more and more global, and the implications of technology and social media seem to be lost on us, and we don't seem to know how we can address it. How in the world can we have freedom of speech and yet stop ourselves from being influenced by the toxic stuff that's out there? Folk who study such things tell us that we're in the midst of a cultural shift when the way we used to understand the world just doesn't quite fit anymore, but at the same time, the new era hasn't quite taken shape and we don't know quite where we're going. Maybe, some of them say, we'll never know where we're going, and it will never quite take shape, because change will be too pervasive. Well, there's a, a theologian who uh, works at Claremont Seminary, and uh, who works on such issues, and he says when we look at the past, at the modern era, we're past the modern era now, there were three characteristics that we took for granted, all of which are crumbling. That was the time most of us sitting here grew up, the modern era. And, and as I talk about these things, I certainly identify with them, and I'll bet you will too. One of the first things he said we believed in the modern era was the power of the human mind, that it is at the center of anything, and nothing is beyond us if we just apply our very best minds to it. We can fix any problem. We can make anything better if we just put the resources there and work to make it happen. Yeah? Yeah? And, and then th there was a, a term that, you, that he used called melioristic optimism. That is the idea that we are on the right track. 
and things will only get better. Now, there might be some little snags along the way. We'll hit some potholes. Maybe we'll even find ourselves blowing out a tire and we'll have to pull over and change it. But we're still going in the right direction. You remember the famous quote from, from Martin, uh, Martin Luther King, where he said, the arc of history bends towards justice. That's that kind of an idea. It might take a while to get there. Some of us won't see the end of it, but we can trust that's where we're going. Melioristic optimism. Got it. Got it. And then the last one that he said it, it marked kind of a tension in the modern era, that struggle between the idea of absolutism versus relativism. And he said in the modern era, you had to pick one. You either believed in absolutism, where everything is fixed, it's just as it's written, kind of like fundamentalism, and that's where we stand, and there isn't any room for wiggle, or relativism, where everything is relevant, or is relative, and, and, and you struggle with that. But you had to pick, he said, in the modern world, between one or the other. And he says, all of that's crumbling. All of that's crumbling. And what do we do when we face a world when we have learned these values that suddenly, or the, these, this, this perspective on life, this paradigm of the way the universe works, and suddenly it just doesn't feel like it fits any longer. Jeremiah reminds us that God is still at work. That quote from Adoniram Judson could sound like melioristic optimism, but maybe it sounds like faith instead. God's promises remain. God's yearnings for wholeness, for community, that each of us find ourselves in a world where we are known for who we are and loved for who we are, where each of us can find a place where we contribute and make a difference. And Jeremiah trusted that future was coming. And I think that's Jeremiah's word for us today. It would be so, so very easy to be cynical about everything these days. Wherever we find ourselves on the political spectrum, we can all find an easy way to look at the other side of the political spectrum and point a finger. And for those of us who find ourselves trying to, trying to, to, to survive in the middle, we feel like we're getting shot from both directions and just want to turn it all off and rest. Jeremiah's word to us is, well, yeah, it, we can live in difficult times. We can live in difficult times. But what we need to know that when we are in those difficult times, the promises of God are still there for us. And that things can get better, will get better, because God is at work, and God has called us to work in partnership with God. I don't believe that the human mind can accomplish anything that it imagines. I don't. But I do believe that in partnership with God, we can make this world a better place. Probably racism is going to take generations and generations more to get rid of. Sexism is going to take generations and generations more to get rid of. Inequality is going to take generations and generations more to get rid of. Dealing with the, the difficulty of, of how you live in a global world when we still have individual nations and what it means when you allow capital to go across borders without blinking but then put up walls to keep people from going across borders. And how do we deal with all of those difficult questions? That's going to take a while. And it's not, not going to be easy. And it's going to take folk from all across the ideological spectrum working together to find answers that make, make sense. But I believe that is exactly the world for which God yearns. And if we 
can be willing to work with God, we can see that better world come closer each and every day. I think Adoniram Judson was right. And, and if you know any of his story, his life was not an easy life. I, off the top of my head, I forget how many of his wives died <coughs> as he was a missionary in, in the Far East. Cheryl just said three. But his first, his first work in, in Burma, he preached for years and years and years and years. He had one convert. One. And he saw that as success. Can you imagine going back to uh, your boss and saying, well, I've been working three years and I made one sale. It was a small one, but I did it. And in that he stood and said, ah, but the future is as bright as God's promise. And what is God's promise? Shalom. Wholeness. Community. Grace. Love. The kingdom of God. That's what we work for. That's what God is bringing as we work together with God.